Welcome to the first round of the Brewmaster Challenge, fellow wizards. In their fight against the Spike Scourge, our eight competitors may need some help. From the future, the brewers were allowed to choose any pre-modern card that is not banned or on the watch list. They were then given four days to build an otherwise Atlantic legal 9394 deck that also includes four copies of their chosen card. Remember, the finalists will play a best of five with all three of their brews to see who will be crowned the champion. Let's take a look at the round one bracket. So far, Elliot's Enchantress was victorious over Florian's Gushball, and Johnny's Well-Oiled Machine took down Danny's version of Enchantress. This episode will feature DFB and Brother Jonas. Best of luck, brewers. Don't forget to vote for which brew you like best at the end of this video. Hello, wizard. Tell us a bit about yourself and your magic history before we jump into your round one submission. Uh, hello, Guardian. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Dave Firth Bard. Um, I, uh, I live in Boston. Um, I am a, an organizer for New England Old School. Um, I also organize the uh, summer and winter uh, derby series, which is a a Skype tournament for old school magic that's been going on the last couple of years. Um, uh, a bit about my history with the game. Um, mostly, I, I mean, the last few years in, in being part of the old school community is really the the most serious I've I've been involved with with the hobby. I think um, I came back to the game, so to speak, in in 2014 thereabouts, and started buying into old school in 2015. Um, so yeah, for, but for the last like three and a half years or so, I've been um, really pretty deeply involved with uh, with uh, the old school movement here in, in the U.S. and playing a ton on, on Skype and and last couple of years in in Greater Boston and elsewhere in, in New England as well. Um, and you know, and otherwise, I mean, I started playing when I was a twelve year old uh, kid. You know, when uh, I think right around when. Fallen Empires was out and 4th edition was not yet out was about when I started, like early spring uh, 1995. Um, you know, had no idea what I was doing because I was a stupid kid, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but had a lot of fun with my friends and then put the game away for a while like you do and uh, played a little bit more in, in college, um, which would have been around... Actually, I, I remember specifically it was it was the, the changeover from the old card frame to the new card frame. Um, so between, uh, what is that onslaught block and Mirrodin. And I remember even at the time being like, Oh, I, anything, anything new is bad. I just wanted to play with the old cards. Um, even then. So I, I've ha of always course. had that old school magic impulse. Well, yeah, the, the, the new cards, they don't look like a page from your spell book. What, That's are, right. what are we even doing? I don't even That's know. Right. What are we even yeah. doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, wise words from the guardian. There you go. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so what did you brew, and specifically, why did you choose the card from the future that you chose? Sure. Um, so I built uh, a mostly black and green um, desolation deck, um, and I was really at a loss when I was looking at cards from the future um, because I really didn't, really wasn't active um, during the the period of the, the pre-modern card pool, right? Like I kind of checked out, you know, of magic and into other hobbies uh, around the time, it must've been like 96 or so around the time, like Mirage okay. block was, was rolling. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like I said, when I dipped a toe back in around 2002, 2003, call it, um, I wasn't really interested in getting into the, the new cards and, by then, like all of the the interesting pre-modern times had already kind of passed, awesome. um, so I never you never played like Urza's block or any of that fun stuff. Um, so I really I had to um, uh, basically look at Scryfall, um, and so what I didn't do I didn't ask for help from friends. I didn't uh, go on the pre-modern website to look at like archetype ideas at all. Sure. Um, I went to Scryfall, and what I did was I said, okay, um, let's try and limit the, um, the, the search parameters here a little bit, um, and let's look for cards that are interesting to build around. Um, and a card type that I always think is interesting to build around 
um, and particularly interesting in old school um, because of the um, partially because of the lack of removal for this card type um, uh, is enchantments, right? Sure. Um, there are there are you know even in modern day magic there are a lot of interesting build build around enchantments, um, and so I, I limited my search to enchantments from um, whatever it is, Ice Age up through uh, Scourge, right? Mm -hmm. um, that have a casting cost of three or less because I wanted to like be able to stick the enchantment, whatever it is, I wanted to be able to stick it early. Um, and then I just kind of like started looking through the, the results that, that came out of that. Um, and a couple of things that were interesting, um, I, I saw uh, a couple of things jumped out. One was... Um, uh, Rolling Stones, <laughs> so I brewed up like a, a wall aggro deck. I'm like, okay, this is interesting, but I think I wanted to do something a little bit more than just kind of straight ahead attacking. Sure. Um, I looked at Standstill because um, I'd never, I'd literally never seen a card Standstill in my life. <laughs> and like, oh, I, I, you could build a lot of interesting control decks with this, but I, that's probably, I, I imagine that like people have played with this card uh, before. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I found Desolation. Um, which is a, a black enchantment from Visions. Um, it costs um, one black, black. Um, and it, it basically says that uh, when, um, whenever a player taps uh, a land for mana on their turn, at the end of their turn, they sacrifice a land. Mm. Um, and so this kind of got my, like, Rube Goldberg uh, supervillain kind of juices <laughs> flowing. Um, and I, I decided that this was for me. Um, I've tried to make different kind of weird, very bad, um, like base black um, prison lists work in old school. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them are terrible. Um, and I thought that with a card like Desolation, they would be a, a little bit less terrible. Mm. Um, so I was excited to, to brew around that. I'd never seen that. I don't, for all I know, there is like a pre-modern like archetype based on Desolation and everyone's like laughing about this right now. Um, but it, it still seems relatively janky, uh, and it, it it seemed like a fun thing to be able to, to build around. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty pretty sweet, and uh, it also as as cards from that era tend to have it just like arbitrarily does something worse to one particular color. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Which I think is funny. Um, uh, anyhow, um, so. Uh, Question I, I've I've uh, been wanting to ask is generally in, in your deck uh, is there some particular interaction between some of the cards that you have or some something that you're particularly excited about uh, that you want to talk about as far as your, your deck is concerned? Um, yeah, so I guess um, so. What we tried to do here is was break the symmetry of desolation. Oh, and actually, there's one. I, I'm clearly not even looking at the at the scryfall. Um, entry there there is as you just alluded to there's another part of the rules text for desolation so mm -hmm. as i said one black black enchantment at the beginning of each end step each player who tapped a land for mana this turn sacrifices a land so actually um it also punishes you for tapping a uh, mana for land on your opponent's turn also so you could you could right. potentially be losing two lands like per um yeah. turn cycle which is interesting mm -hmm. um but then it says Desolation deals two damage to each player who sacrificed a planes this way, <laughs> which is just, I mean, that's just gravy, man, right? I mean, it's a black card. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. That's how it works. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so clearly this is a fun build around that we want to break the symmetry of somehow. Um, and so I decided to try and break the symmetry using um, a, first using a suite of mana dorks. Um, so I have I have Lana War Elves, I have Elves of Deep Shadow, and I have uh, Birds of Paradise. So we have uh, full play sets of each of those. Sure. Um, and the idea, and then we have like all the Moxes and the Lotus. Um, the idea being like you wanna, I want to stick a Desolation on, like on turn two essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have we have the tools to do that, and then we want to minimize the downside of like losing a bunch of lands, or even potentially be able to go about our business without even tapping a land for mana at all. Sure. Um, so hence the dorks and the rocks. That's really kind of the, the base that, that makes all this work. Um, and then, uh, then we're pursuing, from there we're pursuing kind of a denial strategy. Um, this is 
a broken old school with uh, some cards from the future. I imagine people are going to be moxing and using power pretty hard, because uh, why not? Um, so you can't just something. shut down their lands. You have to be able to shut down, um, make sure they're not using moxes. So we have the full suite of crumbles. Nice. We have scavenger folk, which is basically just a, a living crumble that can also mm -hmm. attack. Um, and then we have a couple relic barriers. Um, uh, same idea, just kind of use it as a Rashadin port or something. Uh, sure. um, or or if they should stick some kind of weird artifact creature or threat or something, it doubles as a way of, uh, of dealing with that. Yeah. Um, and then from there, we have a couple a couple ways of dealing damage other than the, the creatures, well, which I'll get back to, because um, there's some in interesting uh, synergies there. Um, I have a, a Black Vice. Um, mm -hmm. which seems good if you're a stranding cards in the opponent's hand. Yeah. And I also have an artifact possession, um, a.k.a. the black psychic venom. Um, <laughs> I figure if they do have another mox or stone or something yeah. that I'm not able to kill, I can at least put it um, on their uh, their mana rock. And then, I mean, if I can draw one of my relic barriers, nice. I can, you know, I, yeah. victory is all but assured, right? Yeah, indeed. Um, and... Uh, so then one interesting um, interaction that I also have um, is with Pendlehaven, right? So Pendlehaven, obviously, I need, um, because all my dorks are green, um, I figure I need, like, uh, something like 16 green sources in the deck to, to be able to stick one uh, reliably early on. But then you need to be able to quickly pivot to um, black, black on the next turn to get Desolation sure. to play. So Elves of Deep Shadow and... And Birds of Paradise um, help with this a lot, right? Because they yeah. both produce black mana. Um, now, Pendlehaven is really interesting because you can use a turn one to put down your dork or to crumble something, which is probably going to be like the typical turn one um, play with this deck. Mm -hmm. um, but also it has an activated abil a tap ability that um, does not trigger Desolation's bad things from happening, right? right. You can use the pump ability from Pendlehaven um, without um, having to sacrifice a land at end of turn to Desolation, sure. um, which is really neat. Um, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and so, yeah, that's really awesome. You can also do that. I have a library um, uh, of Alexandria, of course, in the deck. Mm -hmm. um, same thing there. Um, and same thing with, uh, with Strip Mines um, mm -hmm. activated ability. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a sneaky little thing, um, you know. If you're actually building this, quote unquote, for real, like you could look for other lands with with uh, with abilities that don't produce mana um, mm -hmm. for for extra value. Um, so that was one thing that kind of got me um, got me excited about the deck. And then let's see what else. Rounding out the deck, I have a bunch of just kind of like one ofs that are powerful and and you know uh, you know boring cards uh, like this. Um, <laughs> this is another you know a silver sure. bullet that you see everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, tutor and twist, um, and uh, you know tutor is just great in general. Um, we can we can be bottling people in this deck. We're not really running Arabian Nights cards. Um, sure. So if this is a real old school format. Let's bottle some people. Uh, regrowth, um, same same thing as all the above. A um, couple interesting things. Um, again. Uh, not a lot of enchantment removal in old school, um, so our desolations feel relatively safe. Um, pack and avoid fader two in case uh, yeah. you know, because we definitely want them to stick um, mm -hmm. once they're down. So the avoid fade is for protecting the desolations first and foremost. Um, and then um, you know we don't have sideboards obviously for the challenge, um, mm -hmm. but I wanted to include a main deck tranquility um, as a nod to the fact that other people in this. However, however you want to call this meta <laughs> master <laughs> challenge, yeah. other people may be also building around enchantments um, okay. and you just want a, a way to get out of that too. Hmm. Um, or like, worst case scenario, your desolation is really screwing yourself <laughs> and you can get rid of it that way. Um, but we hope we don't have to do that. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty much that's pretty much the deck. Um, I, I do want to mention my last couple cuts from the deck. Um, sure. I really tried... Uh, well, one is one is a little bit more boring. Um, a risk with playing these land destruction decks um, is often the threats that leak through early um, that that are that are cheap. And so, 
you know, we have a couple ways of mitigating that. One is the, you know, our guys do fight and they fight better with Pendlehaven, um, which helps. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, early on, I had a terror or two um, floating around the main deck. Um, ended up cutting it because there's not a lot of obvious, like, synergy with the rest of the things that are going on. So so that mm-hmm. ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, what would have more synergy, though, and if... Um, it could actually produce more of a, a hard lock. Nice. This is wor- this is Worms of the Earth, which I'm always trying to put into old school decks. Like I've had, oh God, I've had I've had so many like different weird um, like icy manipulator based like black sinkhole type of decks. And man, mm-hmm. I really really want to make this card work. <laughs> Couple problems with this card. And I really, really just I, I should have just left it main deck, but like <laughs> it's it's but it's not good because here are a couple things. So one, it costs two black, black, black. Mm-hmm. Um, and hitting that third black mana when you're already like destroying some of your own lands, um, and uh, you know you don't have I, I don't know some some crazy number like 17, 18 black sources in your deck. It's 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 going to be hard to to put down. Mm-hmm. And then once you do, it's not the lock that you want because the opponent actually has a choice of two different. So for people who don't know what this is, um, I, don't, I don't have the oracle text in front of me, but I'll just read the actual text in the card. No new land may be brought into play. It's an enchantment. P- players cannot play lands sure. um, during any player's upkeep. During either player's upkeep, uh, any player may destroy Worms of the Earth by either sacrificing two lands or taking five damage from Worms of the Earth. Mm-hmm. So, like, and anytime you give your opponent a choice like this, they'll just pick the one that's less, well, you know, that doesn't hurt them as much. Um, mm-hmm. And so all the trouble that you put into getting this cool card out with amazing Anson Maddox art that mm-hmm. fits perfectly with the theme of what we're doing here, they can just like, oh, they take five damage, and it's like you just spent two black, 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 um, like on a bad lava axe, essentially, and that's just yeah. so. Yeah. It's, it's really, really unfortunate that it has that rider. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, exactly. I feel like it would be a pretty well designed card if uh, you just couldn't yes. pay the life. If you, if it was just land sacrifice. Yeah, right, actually. right. If you were just stuck and you just, mm-hmm. yeah, it was like a one sided Armageddon. Basically, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Alas. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I realize you you don't of course, know what exactly the future holds, right? The uh, remaining two rounds are still unknown, uh, different challenges than this one. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but what do you think this deck will have a particularly difficult time against, right? You can't, Like you mentioned earlier, you don't get to sideboard uh, if, if you're playing in the, the final round. So, um, so you can't mitigate your, your deck's problems exactly, you know? But, yeah. Um, but what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I, as I mentioned, like I think... Um, Really low to the ground aggro lists will be a challenge um, because, like any deck that can leak through a couple threats before before the desolation comes down, or even just like you know playing a land into desolation, tapping it, but, but playing a Savannah Lions kind of thing, like that's mm. that's a problem. Gotcha. Um, and so I tried to, like I said, I tried to mitigate some of that with the the three Pendle Havens, which is pretty heavy handed, mm. um, but I think makes a lot of sense here. Um, yeah, I, so I think it's I think that's a challenging matchup. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, I also I appreciate the the different ways that this challenge can sort of go because I feel like there is uh, kind of the method that you employed where you you found a card that you thought was interesting and then mm-hmm. you built a deck around that card. Whereas you can go the other way and go, you know, I I, I saw this card and I I feel like it would go really well in this yeah, in this kind of already existing like an existing yeah. old school archetype yeah yeah yeah, yeah and, uh, uh, and both ways have their their pros and cons right but it, yeah. it just, it's it's just interesting um, to to see this because this is very much not an archetype that you would exactly see in a, a, any kind of old school uh, uh, you know uh, tournament or event so so but yeah it's 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 pretty awesome um, uh, any, any last minute thoughts uh, that you want to share. Uh, no, I'm excited. I actually, I want to buy some desolations <laughs> so can, yeah. and hopefully I'll, I'll find some people who will permit me to, uh, to try and, and give it life. I think that'd be fun. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks Dave and good luck yep. in the voting process. Thank you. Hello wizard. Tell us a bit about yourself and your magic history before we dive into your round one submission. Oh, hi Guardian Beast. Uh, my name's brother Jonas. Um, I'm a magic player from... Uh, London, England, 
and uh, I've been playing since uh, kind of uh, late revised, so I guess it would be like late 94, and uh, I carried on sticking with the game up until the Urza block, where I kind of uh, felt like I should be moving on with my life and doing something more valuable than turning cardboard for a few years, like, I don't know, meeting people at university. Uh, but fortunately, I came to my senses uh, a mere 16 years later, uh, <laughs> and um, and my kind of um, my brother kind of got me back into the gateway drug of old school by uh, buying me my old red deck um, in, in Swedish legal, um, which was a very far sighted move of him, and then kind of kick started my uh, my passion back for back for magic. And uh, but I'm a pure old school player, pretty ignorant about what happened between the years 2000 and 2016, which was an interesting dimension to this week's challenge. Sure. <laughs> Great, excellent. Well, why don't you talk about uh, what you decided to brew and specifically why you chose the card from the future that you chose? Yeah, so um, Brothers of Fire, that's the name of uh, the club that I founded with five other guys from London. And uh, I had a bit of an input to the name and red, red is my color. So sure, yeah. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to go with the red card and my first instinct was to rehabilitate Goblin King because mm. I think he's just such an awesome guy and he doesn't get the thanks <laughs> he deserves uh, and he hasn't got enough mates that are really good in old school. And one thing I did remember um, about kind of my, my later career uh, before, uh, was, um, you know, Mog Fanatic and mm. various other kind of uh, crazy Goblin cards. But the problem was you need like several of them to really make it work but i did still like this idea of goblin so mm -hmm. i needed i needed to tap up an expert the expertise of another brother of fire um on this a little bit which i hope doesn't count as a cheap mr guardian beast no not uh, at all <laughs> so I, kind of, I said to brother stebo like what's a good goblin that got released that doesn't rely on goblin king to to keep going and he was like oh there's this one called goblin welder and i, looked at the and I thought that sounds pretty good um, it's only more recently I've come to understand that it's kind of one of these semi-broken, like, staple cards. Uh, but I was ignorant of that before I, I came to it. So, <laughs> uh, I'm claiming that I kind of discovered it a little bit fresh. Um, yeah, but yeah. what I've done with it has taken a fairly spicy slant on, on what he can achieve. So, mm. yeah, so I, I heard about this guy Goblin Welder and I thought, that sounds really cool because one thing I like about magic, particularly old school, is, like, distorting the colour pie. I like cards that do what? what their colors kind of shouldn't be able to do even in old school there's still kind of conventions around that mm -hmm. you know like sonic blast doing direct damage and and then mm -hmm. fork one of my favorite cards wheel of fortune because they kind of do off color things in red and this guy i thought he can give me like i really um i really resent other other players having you don't play red having recursion and we're having toolbox techniques and i thought sure. this guy do recursion and toolbox for red yeah. Um, and that's what this deck is. It's a recursion and toolbox deck, um, but in kind of mono red with a with a couple of splashes to kind of spice it up even further. Right, right, right. That's uh, that's pretty awesome. I, I I think it's kind of hard to make Goblin Welder super broken, right? Like uh, like you were mentioning, he has a uh, you know a history about him in, in, in Magic of being being a very broken card, right? But I think. Yeah. The old school world really uh, uh, confines a lot of that uh, you know, ability to be be super broken. So it seems seems like a perfect fit, actually. Um, I, I like it quite a bit. Um, uh, I have a few things I've noticed about your deck that I like quite a bit in particular. But I thought I'd, I'd kind of give you a chance before I, I ask about anything. Um, you know, what what do you think is maybe the most exciting thing that you can do in your deck? Since you were talking about it being toolboxy and recursion yeah. oriented like you know what, what what's the thing that you are most excited about and, and granted you may not have actually played the deck before i i uh, most most people hadn't uh but um and that's totally understandable but um but yeah so what, what do you what do you uh have to say about that yeah well i think for me like you can't be truly spicy unless you're playing one offs because okay. you know one offs for me it's like that's what gives you the kind of variability when you play a deck multiple times Sure. So it's got a lot of one offs. So like some of them are cards which are like obviously really good and quite toolboxy. So mm -hmm. I like the idea of being able to dig out a Nev's disc. So I'm hearing that the Brewmaster meta game is very <laughs> enchant heavy, uh, and <laughs> there's a lot of um, guys playing creatures with Shroud, which I think is kind of slightly against the spirit of the competition. <laughs> I see, uh, I see. Um, but uh, yeah, so I kind of figure you can clear away a lot of Argothian enchantresses if you if you can get your disc out. But really, mm -hmm. I guess um, yeah, I mean, use Bazaar of Baghdad to fill up the bin. 
with no really nice one offs. So you know, Ashland's Transmogrant I thought was pretty pretty spicy pick because mm -hmm. first I think the card is slightly underplayed. I think it's kind of close to being good. It's kind of one of those tantalising fringe cards. But I figure in this in this deck I can either use it as fuel for the welder or I can put it on opponents like Sarah Angel and then make them change their angel for a mox or something. Yeah, that's um, pretty awesome. I think every deck needs a king. Like, I think if you're going to play spicy, you need a king card. You know, I was kind of inspired by Mano's um, Gwendolyn de Corsi that he plays in his Spice Rack deck. Mm. And uh, so Adam Oakenshield is the king of this deck. But actually, he's, he's kind of on theme because... He's re his, he can recur the Goblin Welders if they get if they get killed in theory, yeah. and uh, so I kind of quite liked him. Um, I think you need a nice fatty, so the Colossus is there. I mean, in theory, I could hard cast that with the Mana Vaults. Mm. Um, I love being able to put Mana Vault in the bin for like for advantage. So using a Sage of Latinam or an Atog. There's one Atog in this deck. I appreciate that's a little bit uh, spiky. <laughs> uh, and also completely against the theme, obviously, which is generally to kind of preserve the artifacts and do cool right. stuff. But I think yeah, you, you want to sw swap them, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but in the words of the master um, DFB, you know, utility trumps synergy, and mm. uh, this, is a, this is a case of uh, maybe Ator kind of slightly, um, slightly giving me that utility, but but not really synergizing with the rest of their deck. Yeah, and then um, Copper Tablets, one of my one of my favorite cards. I love the way it just gives gives the game just an instant clock, um, mm. and it's, it's kind of food for the uh, for the welder. Uh, so yeah, and then and then the regrowth and the demon tutor are kind of there for for welders really. Mm -hmm. uh, because the regrowth synergizes with um, the bazaar of Baghdad too. So I guess I kind of see all the cards kind of fitting together, but mm -hmm. there's not really a kind of big master plan. It's just it's, I, I quite like decks that are quite versatile, and mm -hmm. hopefully it just means you get a really fun interactive game, um, which is which is really what you need because if you're going to be spicy, you need you need a fun interactive game rather than. Uh, just sitting there kind of hoping your three card combo is going to resolve and then the other player can do whatever he wants if that makes sense sure. yeah yeah definitely yeah i also like uh how it, you know it, it, uh, the way that the finals match works right there's no sideboards right and so i feel like you you need a good you need a good general game plan right and uh i feel like this deck has a lot of that you know you and you have a lot of like you're saying you've got a lot of one-offs but those things i feel uh you know, kind of help you get out of situations that you might have a hard time getting out of, you know. Um, uh, Fisher is a great example, right? I actually really like that card. Um, yeah. Uh, just, just for my own purposes, but uh, um, things like that, right? And uh, and just having a having a, a very general game plan that gives you lots of lots of solutions to things is always is always a good plan. Um, and I always love a bizarre Baghdad deck. <laughs> um, yeah, this is I one think of those places where you can use it. I guess the big worry for me with this deck is the card draw. Like, you've mm. got the wheel, um, but the bazaars are pretty hungry on card advantage. Um, and there's a danger you're just going to draw a load of moxes and, you know, the mana vaults. But then, worse, even then you're going to be sitting on a ton of mana, so there's a big fireball. You know, there's the fissure, yeah, which is obviously expensive, but when you've got all that uh, jewellery working on your side, it kind of becomes hard castable. Mm. Um, yeah, and then worst case, you've got you've got these little guys, um, and you've got a lot of just useful artifacts. The Aella pile is like a bit cute as well, like it's because mm. obviously with a red deck you don't normally need to play need to play that, but I just quite like the idea that you can use it for a bit more ping damage, yeah. um, or you can or you, again you can feed it to the welder. So everything's everything's got got kind of a use on both sides, hopefully. Yeah, and I was also thinking about uh, um, so I don't remember. We'd have to look up exactly how Goblin Molder works in this scenario, but I, I, I am curious if you go to exchange a uh, a Suchi, do you get the mana? I think yeah, the answer that's is, the way yeah, I was... interpreted it. Yeah, so I okay. figured, I figured if you had even if you had one welder down, you could mm. put a Suchi in the bin and then and then draw out the new Suchi, or you could even mm. maybe have um, have a mana vault in the bin, sack the Suchi, get four mana. Pull the mana mm. vault out, tap it. That's like seven mana just for like tapping a welder. Um, gotcha. so that's why there's the the two fireballs and the disintegrate. Um, gotcha. Because I figure that you know the deck's going to be heavy on mana, um, and some of that's going to be you want to turn that into Tetravis and um, Trike. Mm -hmm. um, but I figure, yeah, I figure there's just like loads of cool abusive stuff you can do. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got a couple of workshops in there. Obviously, like in theory, the deck should have more, but I really hate that card. So uh, I just I don't want to play more than two of them on, okay. on principle. I just I just find it a really boring card when someone just goes, oh, mock soul ring, like workshop, make a huge mm -hmm. trike. It's, it's just kind of I just 
I just feel it feels like a really cheesy play. So I kind of sure. feel bad playing playing one workshop, but I also also kind of thought, you know, I don't want to deliberately underpower the deck. So yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, I mentioned this briefly already. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, you you don't quite know exactly what the future rounds hold, right? So yeah. each week is going to be a different challenge, right? And um, so one question I, I like to ask is, you know, what are you worried about kind of in general, in terms of general archetypes, right? You don't know exactly what's coming up and there's a lot of unknowns, but what do you think is something that your deck would have a hard time against? What are you hoping to play against? Those types of questions. Um, yeah, well, obviously I'm hoping to bag a lot of votes from, uh, you know, followers of, of True Spicy Bruce from all over the world. So you can vote sure. up later on, guys. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, uh, I think in terms of, what I'm worried about, I mean, there's not a hell of a lot of disruption. I think people are going to be, in this round, people have been understandably drawn to putting together like quite dinky combos. Mm -hmm. And I think people are slightly probably banking on people aren't running like four disenchant, four swords, divine mm -hmm. offering, because people are trying to get away from the boring cards. Sure. Um, that means I'm assuming that there's going to be people like with funny time vault combos or like weird recursion of recall and, you know, pay tribute to Danny for for stepping aside from his instincts to play some dirtly recursion recall deck. <laughs> um, I imagine there'll be, there'll be some people with that kind of thing and there's limited disruption in this deck. You know, there's the shatters, which kind of feel like uh, I'd be, you know, you, well, firstly, you've got to play them. Secondly, they're, mm -hmm. they're pretty synergistic with this deck because by putting artifacts in my opponent's bin, I kind of give control over their, I, give, I get more control over their board than even mm -hmm. just destroying the, the artifact. Sure, um, sure. But yeah, so I guess... Um, those kind of dirtly mega combo decks uh, are going to be a problem. You know, I'm not, I've not got Red Blast to play. Um, I'd be interested to see. I mean, I guess, like, I, do, I was thinking to myself, well, my original instinct was play, like, a kind of really cool creature deck. But actually, you can't really untap much of the, the value of these new cards because you're not, you're not bringing in a game-changing new creature. Um, or at least if you are, you're only bringing four, which doesn't transform, a, you know, doesn't tr transform the, the archetype. So I'm, I'm kind of figuring there's going to be a lot of combo decks and maybe some of it's going to be who goes off quickest, but this deck should be pretty fast. I mean, I figure you're going to get an early trike down pretty early, pretty regularly. And then if you get that recursion going, keep the guy on the board, keep the welder on the board, um, people are going to be under a lot of pressure, um, no matter how many cards they're drawing. Um, and then in terms of the later rounds, it's hard to know what's going to, what's going to come up, but I figured that this is probably going to be my weakest round because my knowledge of the later card sets pretty pretty poor. Uh, so uh, I'm kind of in, I'm kind of interested to see. Um, yeah, but I feel like this is I feel like this is pretty strong. Like I just I love I mean with red sometimes you can be like you know the phrase like glass cannon you know sure. it's like really effective but when but if it doesn't fire correctly like you can't use it again. And I kind of figure that this deck. You know, it's just it's just kind of got that adaptability, you know, and, and, I, and I love that. Like the last World Championships, I was playing red-white, which isn't like a, an amazing color combo, but it just means you're constantly having interactive games. Um, for me, that's what a good, a good game of Magic is all about. Like that's why, you know, in our club, we play this Brothers Highlander format, you know, 100 card single turn, because every game's different. You know, sometimes after game one, you just take all the cards that appeared and just put them on the side and play with the rest of your deck. For me, it's that, that variability, you know, which is, isn't to say I don't love all the kind of canon core cards, but, you know, there's like, there's, they're, they're, releasing, they're releasing new cards out of Legends like every week, you know. So let's, uh, let's make sure we get into those, uh, those deep old, old school cuts. You know, that, that's my philosophy anyway. Yeah, well, um, I guess we'll kind of uh, close this out a little bit. And uh, do you have anything else you want to mention before we... We, uh, we call it quits. Well, apart from um, complimenting your excellent English, because I'd assumed you you were born in Arabia, uh, Mr. Guardian Beast. So for, you know, for, I, we... I wanted to pay tribute to that. Uh, secondly, I wanted to, again, uh, appeal for more votes because no one's done that yet. So uh, sure. don't forget to vote for me at the end, guys. Um, and thirdly, I just wanted to say um, thanks, thanks to you and your team for uh, putting on this event. It's a lot of fun. Hopefully, I'll be back to compete in the semi-finals. Yeah. And uh, yeah, um, so thank you for having me on. It's been great. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you, and good luck in the voting round. Thanks, everyone. Bye.